my job today is to speak about the, the origins of the macular carotenoids. And we've already heard some reference to that today from, from George Britton in terms of the fruits and vegetables. But I'm going to go into it in a little more detail. And in preparation for this lecture, I was forced to read papers that I would have not normally read information about fish and fish skin and nutrients and uh, like that, nutrients present in, in, in that. So I, I'll get on with it. OK, that's my group there jumping in. OK, so the goals of, of my lecture today, I'm going to, as I said, speak about the amounts of lutein and seasantin in foods, the amount of lutein and seasantin in the diet. So what I mean there is how much are we actually consuming? It's one thing to know how much is in a food. The next question is how much do we consume? I'm going to talk a little bit about mesozeaxanthin because there's a lot of conversation about it now in terms of where we get it. Is it solely converted from lutein? Is that how we get it at the macula? Do we respond to it in terms of supplements, etc.? I'm going to speak about lutein zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin concentrations in commercially available food, food, or commercially available supplements rather. And I'm going to show you some data from our lab that where we've analysed supplements and measured the concentration. And I'm going to come up with some conclusions based on this. These are all the papers, or a selection of the papers that I went through in preparation for this lecture. We've seen nicely today about the carotenoids, lutein zeaxanthin, meso zeaxanthin. Their similarities, but yet their uniqueness in terms of their antioxidant capacity, their light filtration capacity. So this is what we study. This is what we try and understand. Casually, I think we all are guilty of saying leafy greens, colored fruits and vegetables without really knowing or understanding the concentrations within those fruits and vegetables. And, you know, it's, it, it is the primary recommendation for, for, eye, in, for eye health that we say healthy lifestyle, healthy diet. But what foods should we actually recommend? Well, let's have a look at it. I looked at um, a lot of very nice publications, and I've selected some that I felt were best to help me inform this lecture today. The first one is uh, a study done in Europe by O'Neill et al. in 2001. This work was published in the British Journal of Nutrition. And these researchers, they, they sourced a lot of information from many, many sources. And they created, essentially, a carotenoid database. So they developed a database that we could look and see, well, what concentration of lutein and zeaxanthin would be present in, in that particular food. But to help us understand this clearly, I want to maybe put it in context. They, they reported 100 grams, milligrams per 100 grams of food. So the point is, you would have to eat 100 grams of food to get that milligram. And I think that's important to help us scale it. And we've just weighed out here, just for illustration, 100 grams of egg yolk, for example, 100 grams of spinach. So you would have to eat this amount of food to consume that. So let's look at some of the, the quick information. We're all aware of these foods that contain the carotenoids. Um, we can see here asparagus, broccoli, celery, had high concentrations of lutein. A limitation of this database, however, is that they report typically lutein and zeaxanthin combined. And when we look at Liz Johnson's work, we'll see that Liz has managed to split that out so we can look at these carotenoids individually. And I think that's an important uh, step in understanding the nutrient source. Butterhead lettuce, parsley. Peas were one that I wasn't very familiar with. And I can see the peas here um, has a nice amount of lutein in it. Corn, we, we often make recommendations about corn as a good source. The yellow, of course, in the corn is due to the, the carotenoid, primarily lutein. Watercress gave a very high, high result there. I certainly wouldn't eat 100 grams of watercress. But, you know, so we, we should keep asking ourselves these questions. Do we consume these amounts of foods? Or do patients consume these amounts of food? Can we make recommendations? Eggs deserve special mention. Although the concentration of lutein and zeaxanthin may not be as high as what you'd see in leafy greens, we, we, we heard already that the bioavailability may be enhanced because of the fats in the egg. So the egg is an ideal uh, source provider of these carotenoids. I think a rule is you can multiply the number by four or five to get, to get an estimate in terms of what we can actually consume. And we moved to some work done by, by Liz Johnson's group in America. And this study, corn and egg food products, they tested fruits and vegetables. But they analyzed, as I said, separately for lutein and zeaxanthin. And I think this is a very important thing to do. This work by Perry et al. This was published in the Journal of Food Composition and Analysis in 2008. Foods were selected here, and this is important to mention, based not only on the Santafil content, but also on the amount and frequency of consumption, and this using the unique N. Haynes database. 
There's a very extensive database um, to, to provide the information we're looking for. Again, corn, they gave corn a lot of attention. They looked at a lot of commonly eaten corn products. And you can see here that, yes, these carotenoids are present, albeit in, in, in small amounts in these food substances. But this is just an example of, of some. So my Sunday night popcorn is worthwhile. Again, eggs, there's our friend again. Eggs um, came up as a, uh, with some important information there. And we can see here high concentrations of, of zeaxanthin and lutein in those eggs. Spinach. Kale, parsley, you, you, you all know them, but I just wanted to try and put a number on them. If you look at it here, so you're looking at about 8.8 .8 milligrams per 100 grams of, of, of kale. But what does this all mean? You know, even if we do eat these 100 milligrams of food every day and we can get anything up to 6, 7 milligrams, if you eat a lot, a lot of spinach or a lot of kale, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of us to get these carotenoids to their target tissue. I won't go into bioavailability today, but a lot of people in this room know the challenges that that, that presents and um, my, my cell formation, for example, and, and uptake and transport to the target tissues. So th th these are all factors that we have to understand and try and consider. And I know Paul Bernstein may be speaking a bit more about, about, about this later. We know that the concentration in diet, sometimes you can see, depending on the data source you look at, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, but you see that the ratio of lutein to zeaxanthin changes as it goes through the system. Blood serum, for example, that drops 10 to 1. And then zeaxanthin becomes the more dominant carotenoid when we look at the macula. That's if you report it as a total zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin plus. So we all would like to think that we eat, like this lady, fruits and veg every day, and we exercise. But I think when we look at the actual data that Liz and others have presented, the, the reality is somewhat different. And I think this is, is more like what's actually happened. Let's have a look at some of the studies that have reported on this. A study that deserves mention, um, Dr. Alan Howard and, and David um, did, did a very nice study where they compared um, diet between France and, and the UK. And they, they, we know that fruit and vegetable intake is low in the UK, 85 grams per day of fruit, 35 grams per day of veg. And that compares to much higher amounts of fruits and vegetable intake in, in Toulouse. You can see 250 grams per day there of fruit. And what does that mean? It means that the lutein level in the UK is, is, is less than half that of, of the, the Toulouse population that was studied here. So we do know that how we behave, what we eat, ha has an impact, has an effect on, on our serum carotenoid or our plasma carotenoid level. Going back to, to um, the work, to, to this work here, we can see in O'Neill, um, this is bad news for Ireland because you can see here that Ireland has the lowest intake of lutein compared to, say, France or Spain. You can see there about 1.5 milligrams per day. And that, again, is lutein and zeaxanthin combined, which, which is quite a low level. The authors very nicely then traced that to the actual foods that were responsible um, for, for that intake. And you can see that in, in the Republic of Ireland, peas and broccoli um, we're, we're the main providers. Where, but if you compare that to spinach, which we know to be the high lutein provider, that, that's what they're eating in France and Spain. And that was why um, they believed that the differences were, were had. We also had a look at this in, in, in one of our large samples, a population of over 800 people. We used a food frequency questionnaire to try and quantify lutein zeaxanthin intakes. This was the, uh, and we found that about 1.3 milligrams per day on average of, of lutein intake. So as I was reading this literature and as I was looking at paper and paper and paper, and I think David made this point in 2011 that we actually consume relatively low, or low levels of lutein and zeaxanthin. We consume small amounts of these carotenoids. Do we consume enough of these carotenoids in the diet? That's a question you should ask yourself. I have a view which I'll arrive to at the end of my lecture. Again, just to look at Liz's data, the news is even worse for the, for the US population in that if you look at the average across all the ages, it, it comes out a little bit lower than a milligram per day intake of lutein. So the levels are, appear to be low in the general population. Mesozeaxanthin, what do we know about mesozeaxanthin? None of these databases um, have, have reported uh, mesozeaxanthin content in, in, in these foods tested. David mentioned today that you know, it, it's a difficult technique to, to measure mesozeaxanthin. Fred responded by saying, well, he's looked and it's not there. I'm going to show you some data as well from, from our lab. But um, the reality is it hasn't been looked for in great detail. It, 
And that's why we, we can't say it is or it isn't uh, at this point. Is it in nature? Does it exist? Is it, in, is it part of the beautiful colours that Crotonite contribute? And we know from some of the work, Catherine Sheet, for example, 1991, published some work, and we know that in the chicken retina, 47% of total zeaxanthin is mesozeaxanthin. Again, I think George made reference to this already today. Turkey retina, birds make mesozeaxanthin and concentrate it in other carotenoids in the retina within the brightly colored oil droplets. So it's, it's, it's in nature. How does it get there is the next question. And if you look at these papers in great detail, it's clear that it appears to be a metabolite from other carotenoids. So is it generated from astaxanthin? Is it generated from zeaxanthin? We'll learn more about this as the lectures go on today. In terms of foods, the first publication that, that was uh, available, and we're, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with this publication, was by Miyoka et al. in 1986, and he published uh, the presence of mesozeaxanthin in, in marine um, fish. You can see an example here, uh, shrimp, black bass, just to give you an example. And again, the beautiful colors that we see here in the skins of these fish are due to carotenoids, and part of that um, appears to be uh, mesozeaxanthin. Actually, if you, again, as I looked at the literature, I was actually forced back a year. May, the publications may have been submitted in parallel, but a year earlier, in, in, in 85, this publication had documented the, the, the presence of mesozeaxanthin again in, in, in the skin of, of, of these fish. And, it appears that it's a metabolite of astaxanthin. I think if you read the papers, that's what you'll see. Astaxanthin is a, is a commonly uh, fed carotenoid to, to fish in farms. It enhances the pigmentation of these fish, and that's why they do it. And the fish appears to metabolize the astaxanthin to mesozeaxanthin to give it this other carotenoid. This, out of interest, was also present in, in the control fish, so the fish that were, were not fed astaxanthin directly in that farming situation. And the conclusion there was that the occurrence of mesozeaxanthin, so far considered unnatural, is likely in aquatic animals where these have to be understood as me metabolites of the different configurational astaxanthin isomers. Later on then, we see in the publication in 87, again, clear documentation of the presence of mesozeaxanthin in, in the skin of, of, of these fish. This is the tilapha fish. And, um, more recently, uh, again, Liz's group have, have published a paper entitled Lutein, Zeaxanthin, Mesozeaxanthin Content in Egg Yolk and Their Absence in Fish and Seafood. Here we can see the typical assay 2, as we call it, the normal phase chromatography. This is the chromatography that you separate those zeaxanthin isomers. So here you can see the mesozeaxanthin and the zeaxanthin peak. This is the absorption spectrum. And just so you know that each, pe each carotenoid has its own absorption spectrum. They may be similar, but there's the subtle difference in, in those absorption spectrum. So it's a, it's a way you can almost map fingerprint it to the carotenoid of interest. The conclusion from this work, the investigators report that for all fish and seafoods, lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin were not detected. One egg, a Californian egg, contained a small amount of mesozeaxanthin. And the con main conclusion was that in the US, the presence of mesozeaxanthin in the macula is not likely due to dietary sources, although this is a possibility, of course, if you eat eggs of hens that were fed mesozeaxanthin. I need to make reference to the uh, saponification experiment um, presented in, in this work. The authors decided not to saponify. I'll speak later about saponification and, and why I believe it's, it's needed to, to, to uh, extract the carotenoids from fatty foods, but the reason why these investigators didn't do that, was they did an experiment with, pure, with lutein, they saponified it, and they, fe they found that they produced mesozeaxanthin artificially. So we've been looking at this as well very closely for, 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 for quite a while now. This is our chemistry laboratory in Watford. This is Katie Marr, one of the PhD students who did a lot of the work. We did, a lot of, we did some work on fruits and vegetables, and consistent with Fred, we, we didn't find, the quick answer there is we didn't find any um, mesozeaxanthin. The method that we used, carotenoid extraction, saponification, and recovery was as described in the Mioka paper, very similar. Some very subtle changes to that that we don't need to go into today, 
But in all cases, we did the experiment where we saponified at, at different concentrations, different temperatures, and, and we didn't saponify as well. So we wanted to see if there was differences going on there. Here's the standard HPLC conditions. This is the point I wanted to make about saponification. Why would you saponify? Why, why is there a need to saponify? Well, if you look at uh, a fatty food, if you, for example, if you look at, at, at fish skin, which you, you um, would need to deesterify here, because essentially this is a different molecule. So if you run this molecule on a HPLC system, which is the system we use to detect these carotenoids, it's not going to come out at the same retention time if, if it hasn't been broken from, from these bonds. So essentially we're interested in looking at free lutein, free zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, et cetera. There's a cost there, so you have to be careful when you're saponifying. If, if the conditions are not right, if they're not optimal, if the temperature is, is too high, if the duration is too long, you may artifactually generate um, other carotenoids, including mesozeaxanthin. So we also performed the saponification experiment. And we did this, we pure lutein sample, we did two different concentrations here, 10% KOH, or sorry, two different temperatures, 10% KOH at 45 degrees and 120 degrees overnight. You can see at the 45 degrees, there was no production of any of the Cisantin um, isomers. So it didn't produce meso, but in the 120 degrees, you can see clearly that you do produce um, these, these, and this is kind of expected. I mean, if you do it at 120 degrees, that's essentially how it's, how it's done in industry. And I've already given you this result, um, but the, the punchline here was in the foods that we looked at, just like Fred, um, we haven't detected the presence of mesozeaxanthin in these foods. We've also looked at fish, because obviously the literature pushed us in that direction, that if it was going to be there, it was sensible to look at these foods. And we did our experiment based on a, a three-point identification process. And a lot of you will be very familiar with this. First thing is simple retention time matching. So if you have a standard, standard of lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin, they come out at a, a unique retention time. So this is the time that this molecule should come out on the HPLC system. And here you can see mesozeaxanthin. So they would need to match. That's the first point of the investigation. The second thing is you need to match the, the absorption spectrum overlay. It has to have that same absorption spectrum. And the third thing we did was we did um, spiking. So we, if you add a mesozeaxanthin standard to the peak that you believe to be mesozeaxanthin, this peak should increase by the amount that you add, et cetera. So this is also known as co-eluting. So here's some of the results. In the non-saponified fish skin, we did meat, by the way, we did meat and skin in all samples, and we did the experiment three times for each. In the non-saponified, we absolutely found no, no uh, carotenoids. So for me, that proved that saponification was needed in order to detect the presence of, of these carotenoids. You can see here, this is messy chromatography, hands up, but it's difficult when you're dealing with foods um, like this. It's not the nicest chromatography, but you can see here the mesozeaxanthin peak. Um, we confirmed this by retention time matching, but also by spiking that peak. We increased that peak of, of interest there, and the absorption spectrum also matched. So this is an example of salmon skin. Essentially, there's the experiment. Um, you can see the, the yellow in there is the carotenoid coming out into the, the solvent of, of use here. Sardine skins were another one where we found mesozeaxanthin. So this is consistent, I think, with, with the literature in general when you look at the other studies that have shown this, but um, we were able to confirm that finding mesozeaxanthin here. You, you, you add the standard meso to it, it increases by that amount. Trout skin, you can see it there as well. And again, the same message, and this is just showing you that we did that three-point experiment for each. And it was also in the flesh, actually, of trout. Um, and you can see it here. Again, the saponification that we used, obviously, based on our ex original experiment was that 45 degrees overnight experiment. Some other data I'd like to show you. Um, we've also been looking for a while at, uh, and we were forced to look, by the way, at, at, at supplements based on some of the data we were getting in our clinical trials. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But we were looking at commercially available uh, food supplements. And we want, and you can see here that there's many, we all know that there's many, many food supplements that, that, that you can test, that you can use to, to try and increase your lutein. But not all these have been tested for their concentration. Does it have exactly what it says on the tin, I suppose, is the question here. 
And um, again, the chromatography you'll see here is, is, is much nicer because we can adopt a, a more cleaner two-step approach where you can collect your zeaxanthin fraction from, from peak one. And here's a description of, of, of the method that we use. Here, as you can see, the chromatography is nicer. There's your assay one. So there's, typically, this is a, your reverse phase chromatography. So you have a reverse phase, so it's this particular type of column. And when you run that, you can see that you get a lutein peak, a total zeaxanthin peak. We call that total zeaxanthin because contained within that is if mesozeaxanthin is going to be there, it's going to be under that peak. And that's why David mentioned this morning that you know, we, typically you wouldn't do this chromatography in routine um, carotenoid analysis. And then when you collect that peak, you essentially run it on another system, and you can see you can split up the isomers there. And by method of proportions, so if we know the total concentration of this peak, we, we, can, we can work back and get the, using the ratio, come up with the, the method of proportion concentration. And there you can see the absorption spectrums. So here's some of the, the data, just to give you a quick uh, flavor of it, a snapshot. Um, the first supplement I have here is a supplement by Bosch and Lam, Occuvite Lutein. You can see that the concordance here was quite good. The total carotenoid pretty much matched. They declared 12 milligrams of carotenoid. That is essentially what we found. But we start seeing a trend in some of these supplements whereby we were also seeing that they contained mesozeaxanthin. So this wasn't declared, obviously, on the label, but it was present when we did the analysis on that uh, two-step assay that I, I just showed you there. And is it a, is it a lot? It's 1.22 milligrams. I'm going to show you what that actually means to serum in the coming slides. Lutein omega-3, this is a supplement used, used in Ireland. Again, the same thing. What we see in a lot of these supplements is, it, is actually they have a lot more carotenoid in there than, than, than what's actually declared on, on, on the label. And that has implications for us. That has implications for clinical trials. If we don't know exactly what's in the supplement, I think it has implications. Again, we can see the trend here, mesozeaxanthin present. Macashield, which is the supplement used um, here in the UK and in the US, um, Macu Health. You can see here the concordance here was, was very good in terms of the matching the concentration. And obviously, they declare mesozeaxanthin and it matched up in terms of what they said they had. You can see here the very big mesozeaxanthin peak on that assay, too. This supplement I wanted to make special uh, mention to because this was one of the supplements we used in our clinical trial. And it, it, we claimed it as a 100% pure uh, lutein, lutein zeaxanthin supplement, no meso. But when we were looking at the serums, it had an effect. And I'm going to show you that. It had 0.3 milligrams of meso zeaxanthin in, in that supplement. What does that mean? Well, here's what it means exactly. So what, what do you do? You start a clinical trial. There's a lot of money behind the trial to, to, to run it, to manage it, to, to, to conduct it, and to report it. And then you get your blood sample, you do your chromatography, and you can see a, a mesozeaxanthin peak there. And we had to ask ourselves why. We spent weeks <laughs> trying to come up with, is, is there a conversion happening in serum? And then the obvious question was asked, well, did anyone check the supplement? So we went back to the supplement, and, and that's essentially why we started looking at these um, commercially available food supplements. The amount of carotenoid that that related to in this supplemented subject, this is just one example of a subject, 0.022 micromoles per litre, which is a little lower than normal zeaxanthin levels in an in unsupplemented diet. So it, it, I would think it's, it's relevant. Obviously, given that ARIDS2 uh, has been published and we look forward to, to the keynote lecture and that, we had a quick look as well at, the, at the, ARID, the, the ARID supplements that were available in the US. And here's a, a supplement that's promoted as ARIDS1 plus lutein. So this was around before ARIDS2 came out. And again, we can see here that there's a small amount of um, mesozeaxanthin um, in this supplement. We got the ARIDS2 supplement as well, the one that's on, on the market now. And again, that comparable to the ultra lutein, it had 0.3. Um, milligrams per capsule. One, and one trend we were able to see here that a lot of these supplements source their lutein from a particular provider. In this case, it, it was the fluoroglow lutein. So the conclusion from these experiments is that mesozeaxanthin is present in, 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 that, in that lutein when it's provided. So the question we have to ask ourselves, nutrition. Yes, we all believe in the power and the importance of nutrition, and it should be what we continue to, to support. But looking at the aging population, looking at the clinical trials, looking at what ARIDS2 has delivered, looking at what Karma has delivered, 
where is the role for supplements? Who is that? I believe that there is a key role for supplements. In, we learned about the at-risk individual today, the risk factors. Can we identify those now by measuring macular pigment and make appropriate recommendation in conjunction with a healthy diet and lifestyle? The main conclusions from, from this presentation and from, from the work that, I, that we did for this is that leafy greens contain the highest amount of lutein. We, we knew that coming here today. Consumption of lutein and zeaxanthin is low in the normal diet, lower than I, than I thought. The literature, as I read it, I, I was quite um, amazed to see that. Mesozeaxanthin is, in, based on our data and consistent with what Fred said this morning, is not, and with Liz's work, is not present in leafy greens or fruits and vegetables. And George suggests that maybe we'll find it someday. Maybe it is there. I'm not sure. Um, consistent with the literature, or, or the majority of the literature, um, mesozeaxanthin is found in, in, in fish flesh in, and, and skin, albeit in, in small amounts. And therefore, we can accept that it's, it's around in nature. It exists. Mesozeaxanthin is pre present in commercially available supplements which do not declare this carotenoid on the supplement. And I think this is important for patients. I think this is important for clinical trials. And we need to be aware of it. So I'd like to um, thank my colleagues. These are the people that directly supported and worked very hard on, on the data I showed you today. It's Katie Marr, Sakina, uh, Maria, and David for his ongoing advice in, in, in the lab. We appreciate it. Um, to acknowledge my team, my group, who've been working on all the trials, and um, you'll see some clinical data, clinical trial data fr from our group over the coming days. As you can see, we're very fortunate to get to work in these beautiful facilities in, in rural Ireland, and as Stephen said yesterday, it's, it's quite an achievement. And um, acknowledgements, of course, and thanks to Stephen for his ongoing direction and support of me and the team. And there, as you can see, a lot of our researchers. You'll get to see a lot of the work we've been doing in the coming days in the form of posters and in, in Professor Beattie's lectures as well. So um, thank you very much, and I welcome any questions you may have. This talk is now open for discussion. Just, just one clarification. Um, I'm not sure what your HPLC methods were for your um, analysis of fish, but in our methods, without saponification, we do detect the carotenoid esters. They would come out on the HPLC. Oh, they do? Yeah. But it wasn't in that publication. It was, in, the publica in the most recent publication, that wasn't presented, was it? No, if, if there were esters in the fish samples we analyzed, they would have been detected. Okay, but it just wasn't discussed in the, in the paper, right? Because we didn't find any. We didn't find yeah. any carotenoids. All right, yeah. But I suppose our data, and I, I would welcome other, other opinion on this, is that you're not going to find it unless you do saponify. If we didn't saponify, we would detect the esters. <coughs> and we didn't saponify, and we didn't detect the esters. So, this was in fish samples? Fish, yeah, yeah and... Blood. No, we didn't look at blood, but we've done this also in um, our lutein ester supplements that we, in our egg study, yeah. where we looked at esters. The and chung, the chung work. Yeah. 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 So I'm and then you, with that. yeah, and that's the same method that we used for the fish but samples. I suppose based on that, then, the conclusion that it's not in fish, how can we say that if we didn't saponify? I think that's, that's where, where my question would be back to you. Because without saponification, you'd see the esters, and we didn't see the esters. You'd see the esters on, on the assay two? Yes. No, no yes. assay one. You wouldn't see well, it? No, we didn't do assay two so because there, was no, there were no carotenoids. Yeah. Neil Kraut on the back there. Uh, Neil and Stephen have it. Uh, we did have a look at some of the, um, like John presented there, the methods. We had a non-saponified sample as well as a mild saponification and a, a harsher saponification that would be very similar to what Mayoka used in his methods. And we did see um, some esterified carotenoids in the, the non-saponified samples. They typically allude at the start of the normal phase method as a cluster. And we did see some esterified zeaxanthins present. But I don't think that we would be able to determine if this was an esterified mesozeaxanthin or an esterified zeaxanthin in that situation. So we felt that saponification was required to see if we could see any difference in terms of their free form elutions. I think that's what you're referring to there, Katie, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can see, you can see that, but you, it's difficult to quantify or analyze that. I think Neil, 
Kind of. Yeah, I'd like to offer a couple comments. One is that um, USDA should be adding lutein and zeaxanthin as separate analytes, uh, if not currently in the near future. We do analysis for them, and, and we separate that out. Um, I would like to, I guess, speak to some of the things about the chromatography, too. And, and uh, I understand C30s. I understand reverse phase, normal phase. And, and you referred to your chiral separation as normal phase. You can do normal phase separations that do not resolve the optical isomers. And that's the approach we take. Then we collect the zeaxanthin, and then we do okay. an optical separation, yep. like your, your, separate dis your second discussion. Um, one point that I think is a little bothersome is that mesozeaxanthin is zeaxanthin. I mean, it's not a, it's, it is unique in that it is an optical isomer. If you say zeaxanthin and meso, what does zea mean then? Because there's the RR, the SS, you know, so it is zeaxanthin, and I think that, you know, the discussion maybe, you know, it needs to separate out specifically RS, and because when people say meso, it was not part of the zea or wasn't claimed in a label, meso zeaxanthin is zeaxanthin. So I wanted to point that out, and then uh, what Liz was saying about the separations, um, you, you can see the esters, as she pointed out, but you're not going to discriminate the, the different optical isomers. And what I would suggest is possibly using uh, a cholesterol esterase or an enzymatic approach to hydrolyze that if you want to be sure that you don't get uh, conversion. Uh, last point is you're using reverse phase to separate your lutein from zeaxanthin. Frequently, there is actually cis lutein that will come out after yeah, we, and co-lute with the zea. We've we've seen that we've seen that as well, and it's something we're looking at at the minute. Yeah. So thank you for your suggestion.